Our scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 34. The words will be on the screen or you can find it on page 800 of your pew Bible. And I will be reading from the common English Bible. A certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother. Then the ruler said, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said, there's one more thing. Sell everything you own and distribute the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. When he heard these words, the man became sad because he was extremely rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, it's very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. Those who heard this said, then who can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible for humans is possible for God. Peter said, look, we left everything we own and followed you. Jesus said to them, I assure you that anyone who has left house, husband, wife, brothers, sisters, parents, or children because of God's kingdom will receive many times more in this age and eternal life in the coming age. Jesus took the twelve aside and said, look, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything written about the human one by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be ridiculed, mistreated, and spit on. After torturing him, they will kill him. On the third day, he will rise up. But the twelve understood none of these words. The meaning of this message was hidden from them, and they didn't grasp what he was saying. Here ends the reading. Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. We just read the passage that's commonly referred to as the rich young ruler, right? Jesus' exchange with the rich young ruler. This young man comes up to Jesus and asks about eternal life. And there's an exchange about obedience to the commandments. But when Jesus looks in the ruler's heart and sees what his barriers are, he identifies wealth as this person's barrier to personal assurance of salvation. Because that's what's actually missing here, right? If we ascribe to the belief that we are saved by faith, we know that this person is saved, this person has eternal life, this person is in the kingdom already. So it's not actual eternal life or salvation that's missing, but the person's assurance that they are saved, that they have eternal life. And for this person, their wealth is a barrier to that assurance. It keeps them from having the ability to live out of the reality of eternal life and salvation. Then we get the whole exchange with the disciples because they have grown up believing that wealth means God's blessing. If you are rich, God loves you. And Jesus challenges that in this sermon because he points out that wealth has its own distractions. Sometimes we talk about this exchange when we talk about it in Bible studies or when preachers preach on it. We like to emphasize that this was a one-time commandment for one person. But actually, if we take a look at Luke's gospel, Jesus talks at least three times in Luke about people giving away all their possessions. We just heard the one. We just heard the one in Luke 18 with the exchange with the rich young ruler. But there's, let's look at the other two. So in Luke chapter 12, Luke is recording similar teachings to what we have on the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry, do not get angry, all of that stuff is going on. And then in verse 33, Jesus says this, sell your possessions and give to those in need. Make for yourselves wallets that don't wear out, a treasure in heaven that never runs out. No thief comes near there and no moth destroys. And then in Luke 14, there's a whole discourse on the cost of discipleship, and we get these really weird analogies. I think they're weird. They sound funny to me because this isn't how modern society works. But the first analogy is like no one starts building a tower unless they have money to complete it. 
right? You don't start a project unless you know you have enough resources to get the project all the way done. And then the second analogy, which is also an interesting one, is no one goes to war unless they think they have enough people and enough weapons to win the war, right? This is just common sense, isn't it? You don't enter a battle you think you might lose. You find a way to negotiate your way out of it, right? You enter battles that you think you might win. And so after these two analogies, Jesus says this again in verse 33. Isn't it funny that they're both in verse 33? In the same way, none of you who are unwilling to give up all your possessions can be my disciple. In counting the cost of discipleship. So, I offer up to all of us today, if Jesus says, give away your wealth three times in the gospel we should probably at least take time to wrestle with and do some discernment about our relationship to money. So the question is, why would wealth be a barrier to the assurance of salvation? Why would wealth be a thing that Jesus encourages his followers to redistribute voluntarily? Because that's what this is, right? This is voluntarily redistribution. This is charity giving. This is not a church tax. Right? This is someone coming in and saying, you give it away. There's at least one more time in Luke's gospel that I want to tell you about before all three of these passages where Jesus just might be talking about wealth. This is from Luke chapter 11. Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as just as John taught his disciples. Jesus told them, when you pray, say... Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who has wronged us, and don't lead us into temptation. Give us the bread we need for today. Not for the year ahead, not a storage barn full, not a suitcase of bread or a grocery sack of bread, but the bread we need for today. Our God is a God of daily bread. And this isn't new to the New Testament. When the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, somewhere between Egypt and the Promised Land, God provides bread. But when God provides bread... God provides daily bread. They were only allowed to gather as much as they needed for that day, except the day before the Sabbath. So they gather the money, the bread <laughs> that they need for that day, trusting that the next day there would be more bread. God is a God of daily bread. There's another story in 1 Kings where Elijah, who's been out in the wilderness, and he's been fed by crows and angels, and it's kind of an, an interesting story. He's told to go back towards civilization, even though civilization is experiencing a famine, and he's told to find a widow to live with, and the widow is going to feed him. So he finds this widow next to this creek, and she is getting ready to make her last loaf of bread. I told you it was a famine, right? And Elijah comes up to her and says, will you make me something to eat? And she says, sir... I have a little flour, and I have a little oil, and I'm going to make a loaf of bread, and then my son and I are going to die. We're going to starve to death. This is, this is the end for us. I don't have enough to feed you. And Elijah says, if you trust me, if you trust God, there will be enough. You and your son will survive this famine. And so she does this. Scripture tells us that God miraculously multiplied the flour and oil so that it fed Elijah and the widow and her son for the entire famine. But what scripture doesn't tell us is how much flour and oil there was at any given time. And I wonder, because our God is a God of daily bread, I wonder if there was only ever enough for that day. If she woke up the next day and there was flour and there was oil for that day, and I wonder, I imagine, I ponder how long it took her to stop saying that refrain, I'm going to make bread for today and tomorrow we're going to die. To not only trust that God is the God of daily bread, that there would be enough for today, but that there would also be enough for tomorrow. 
that God would show up again and continue to be the God of daily bread. Wealth is a barrier to the assurance of personal salvation because wealth tempts us and allows us to forget that God is a God of daily bread. We start to develop, it doesn't matter how much wealth we accumulate, we can be tempted, or how much money we make with each paycheck, we can be tempted to develop a scarcity mindset. Even if we have a savings account and a retirement plan, even if we have a good insurance policy and have built up equity like grown-ups are supposed to do, even if we know that the paycheck will show up twice a month or once a month, we can fall into a scarcity mindset and we forget that God is a God of daily bread. For some of us, we're in a scarcity mindset because regardless of how much money we're making, we're spending more than we're bringing in. Or we're spending all that we're bringing in, right? We would call that living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe that's the experience you're having in your household. For some of us, we're in a scarcity mindset because we want to be considered wealthy. We've been taught that being wealthy is a good goal to have, or we're worried about the future, and so we're planning for the day ahead. But what if we learn to live on enough for the day? Not overspending, not hoarding, but enough for our daily bread and our daily needs. In John Wesley's sermon, The Use of Money, John Wesley is the founder of, United, of Methodism, if you didn't know that, and he has sermons on every kind of topic you could possibly imagine. Some of them are easy to read, most of them are a challenge to read, but he has this sermon on the use of money where he outlines three principles that we should practice when dealing with money as Christians. His first principle is earn all you can. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? If you are capable of work, go work. And take in the money that you can take in. Earn all you can. We should work. We should bring in financial resources to the best of our abilities. Work and earning is a good gift that we can offer. His second principle is save all you can. We are called as Christians to spend less than we make whenever possible. Now, listen, I know, I'm standing up here giving a sermon about this in the middle of a time when groceries are expensive, utilities are expensive, housing is expensive, but we're called as Christians to take a serious look at the luxuries we've elevated to needs. Hear that again. To take a serious look at the luxuries we've elevated to needs and ask if we could live more simply. Ask if we could live more simply. Get down to our daily bread. And honestly, if we all took a look around our houses and our spaces, most of us are probably drowning in too much stuff. So we could take a break from like, accumulating more stuff. So earn all you can and save all you can. And the culminating in the third principle to give all you can. The purpose of earning and saving is to voluntarily redistribute wealth so that everyone has daily bread. If you are capable of earning and saving, you're called to share. Jesus doesn't say just arbitrarily get rid of your wealth, go throw it in a river and just make it go away. He says give your wealth away to the poor those who, for whatever reason, cannot earn and cannot save. Now, I know some of you are sitting up here going, oh my gosh, the pastor just told us to give away all of our wealth. I'm not allowed to have any kind of savings. <sighs> Take a breath. The good news is, Jesus speaks in hyperbole. Take a breath. Jesus often teaches in hyperbole. And here's how I know that. Jesus has a teaching that's very well known about if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Anybody walking around with gouged out eyes or cut off hands? No? This, by the way, is another one when people tell me they're biblical literalists. I'm like, oh yeah? <laughs> Got any gouging going on? Jesus speaks in hyperbole because he's inviting us to wrestle with our relationship with money. He's inviting us to remember that God is a God of daily bread. 
and that if we are given more than we need for our daily bread, we are invited to wrestle and to ponder and to pray about what we're actually meant to do with it, how we might voluntarily redistribute it in order to help others have daily bread. That God is a God of having enough for today, trusting that tomorrow there will be enough for tomorrow and being the instruments of daily bread for those around us. Amen?